Analytical Chemistry 1, Lesson 16. The practice of analytical chemistry both uses and invents instruments and methods with which to separate, identify, and quantify matter. In order to quantify the amount of a substance in a sample with an analytical method, one invariably uses standard materials. In principle, a chemist could run an experiment first against a known standard and then against the unknown sample. The ratio of the response from the method, whether it be the color change of an indicator in a titration or an electrical signal from an optical transducer, they would be linearly related to the ratio of the known and unknown concentrations and would permit the quantification of the unknown sample. However, this approach can be improved significantly by comparing the unknown with several known standards at the same time. This is accomplished using calibration curves. It takes time to create one, but that is what professionals do. Here is the process to follow. First of all, know your sample, not just the material you, you are trying to measure, but also the matrix in which it is found. To what extent will there be other materials there that might interfere with your measurements? What's the range of concentrations you will need to be able to cover given your anticipated range of unknown concentrations? Do you know the range of concentrations over which your method or instrument will be useful? Prepare at least six different solutions of the analyte substance which you're trying to analyze, whose concentrations cover the range of anticipated concentrations. You should prepare at least two solutions for each concentration. Plot them all and see if any of the pairs seem too scattered. Replace any questionable data with another experimental data point. Demanding results will be achieved by preparing each solution from the beginning rather than making up a stock solution that is diluted down. One problem would be at that step when, uh, if that were to happen, then it would propagate to all the rest of the standards. Now prepare a blank solution. You should have a couple of them also. The blank needs to replicate the chemical conditions of the other standards. Everything except the analyte. Measure the signal for each standard and each blank. In the past, calibration curves were plotted by hand. The blank signal was subtracted from all the other data points. The resulting curve would pass through the origin. With computers, however, we can fit the curve and plot that with a non-zero intercept. You can do it either way. In any case, the blank data is incorporated as part of the calibration process. Graph the data as analyte uh, concentration versus signal. What does it look like? Are there any outliers? Does it seem linear throughout the range? Does the curve lead to a good fit of the data? And finally, perform a least squares analysis on the data. Hopefully it fits well to a linear response, but if not, a higher order polynomial or an exponential or logarithmic model may fit better. Experience and knowledge about your analytical experiment can guide your choices. Much of what we will be doing will be with linear models. Let's look at an example. The Lowry assay determines the amount of protein in a sample. A basic copper sulfate solution is added to a solution containing protein. The copper 2 plus ions react with the nitrogen throughout the protein, forming tri or tetradentate chelates throughout. This creates light absorbing centers that peak around 540 nanometers in the green region of the spectrum so that the solution turns a purple color. This was a previous assay that is made more sensitive by the addition of a mixture of two inorganic acids, phospholipidic acid and phospholipidic acid. Uh, this is their chemical formulae and their molecular structure. Note the phosphate group in the center. At the corner of each the octahedron are oxygen atoms, those are the little red balls. And while in the center of each of these 12 octahedra, which are not visible in this picture, are the 12 molybdenum or tungsten atoms. When these interact with copper 1 plus ions formed in the complexes with the nitrogen atoms of the protein, they are reduced from tungsten 6 or molybdenum 6 to tungsten 4 plus or molybdenum 4 plus. They are strongly light absorbing at 660 nanometers in the red, which produces a blue solution. They also interact with the aromatic amino acid residues, mainly tryptophan and tyrosine, and they have also been shown to have some response to cysteine. The assay has proven to be very useful measuring protein content or protease activity. This 1951 paper has often been found to be the most cited scientific paper ever with well over 300,000 citations. Now once you've made all the samples and measured the optical absorbance at 660 nanometers, you might have a set of data such as this. You would now graph the data. There are 16 data points, including the two blank solutions. What do you see? 
what should be our next step? Well, hopefully there's one data point that jumps out at you as not as being out of place. Now, without a good statistical uh, way to uh, determine whether or to leave it in or not, it nevertheless seems that it really should be done again. So you do that experiment again, and that data point changes, giving us a new graph. Now, that looks better. Is there anything else you see that might give you pause? Well, something funny is happening at the high concentration end. If I draw a best fit line through all these data, I get this line. And you might think, well, that's not too bad. But for the four concentrations in the middle, both of the replicates for all of them are above the line. It seems that we should be able to do better. Turns out it's common for experimental signals to saturate near the top of their range. The instrumentation is unable to deliver more signal and its rise starts to taper off and finally flatten out. The curve really looks more like this. So we instead fit the straight line to just the first six, well, 12 groups of six data points. The graph now looks like this. The response of the system is linear up to about 215 micrograms per milliliter of protein. Also on this graph is displayed the equation of the best fit straight line. Recall that the general equation for a straight line is y is equal to mx plus b. Here the slope m is 9.959 times 10 to the minus 4. The y-intercept b is 0 0.1053. So what do we do with this? Well, we take an unknown sample, pop it in the spectrometer, and measure its absorbance. Let's say we measure 0 0.2255. What is the protein concentration? The variables in the equation are such that y is the absorbance and x is the protein concentration. We must rewrite the equation to solve for x. This absorbance signal corresponds to a protein concentration of about 120.7 micrograms per milliliter. But we've been working hard to understand errors and confidence intervals and so forth. Where does that come in with using this calibration curve? How confident are we in the values for the slope and the intercept of this best fit straight line? Here's the data again. I will first give you a bunch of equations, then I will show you how Excel does much of the work for you with one command. The first thing to remember is that we ended up fitting just a portion of our data, the part that gives a nice linear fit. Remember that from here on, we are only working with the portion of the data that has now been shaded. The next aspect deals with what are known as the residuals. Our linear model fit to the data is given by the dashed orange line in the graph. For any value of x, the protein concentration, the line gives the value of the absorbance that the model predicts. Now a circumflex or a hat is placed over a variable to indicate that it is a model predicted value. Now the x sub i are the protein concentration values for our 16 standard measurements that make up the calibration curve. y sub i are the absorbance measurements determined for each of these 16 x sub i's. Our experiment so far consists of 16 X, Y, Y, I, X, I, Y, I combinations. They make up our calibration graph. And in fact, we only use 12 of them to produce our straight line model. As you can see, each of our Y, I values is close to, but not exactly on the line of the model. The difference between Y, I and Y, I hat is what is called the residual. Some Y, I's are above the line and some are below. Therefore, some residuals are positive and some are negative. If we square each one, we will have the square of the residuals. When we add them all together, we have the sum of the square of the residuals. The whole point of the least squares process was to find the equation of the orange dotted line that would minimize this sum of squares, the least squares process. Our process has already made this as small as possible given that we insisted that it would be fit by a straight line. If we divide this sum of squares by n minus 2 and take the square root, we will have the standard deviation of the residuals. It's also called the standard error of the y estimates. We divide by n minus 2 because we have taken out two degrees of freedom already, the slope and the intercept of the equation. This gives us a number, and it is used in many more expressions. For instance, the slope of the equation is an important value. It tells us about the sensitivity of our experiment. The steeper the slope, the more sensitive is the experiment. It means that it's easier to distinguish between two nearby values. The uncertainty in the slope is given by this expression. We could assign a confidence interval to the value of the slope by selecting a t-statistic from the t-table after specifying the probability level and using n minus two degrees of freedom. 
And remember, while we have a total of 16 data points plotted, we're only using 12 for our, fit, our straight line fit. Therefore, our equation has 10 degrees of freedom. The uncertainty in the intercept is also very important. The intercept region is where the protein, in this case concentration, becomes very small. The uncertainty in the intercept is what limits our ability to detect small amounts of our analyte. It dictates our experimental detection limit. And it's given by this expression. And again, you can assign a confidence interval to this value. But the way that calibration curves are most commonly used is to measure the instrument response for an unknown sample and use that to find the unknown's properties, such as concentration of protein, as in our current problem. We already showed how to find the value of the unknown, but what about the uncertainty associated with that value? Recall that we, are <coughs> we considered an unknown sample placed in our instrument and measuring an absorbance of 0.2255. By inverting our best fit linear equation, we identified the concentration of the sample as being 120.7 micrograms per milliliter. But what about its uncertainty? Well, this expression brings it all together. You can produce a confidence interval for your estimate of the protein concentration in the unknown sample. Now look at the terms in this expression. First, we have the standard deviation of the residuals. Note how that term shows up in all of the other expressions. It's these residuals that govern the uncertainty in all of the other terms. Note that it is divided by the slope. Now, the absolute value sign is added because it will be used plus or minus in the end anyway. Now there are three terms inside the square root sign. First, n is the number of data points contributing to the calibration curve. It's 12 in the current situation. The more data points in the curve, the smaller will be 1 over n, which will make the uncertainty smaller. The next term involves k, which is the number of replicate replicates you used for the unknown. If you made only one measurement, then k equals 1, and 1 over k is equal to 1. If you did three measurements, then that 1 over k term is 1 third. Now the last term is a little more complex. The numerator measures how close the unknown signal is to the middle of the calibration region. The y bar is the average of all of the yi values. As the unknown signal gets closer to the middle of our calibration range, this numerator approaches 0. There is more uncertainty in our estimates when we are measuring near the ends of the calibration region. Hopefully you can see how this makes sense. The central region is being influenced by all of the data points, while the ends are benefiting only by those in that neighborhood. The denominator scales this measure in y with the rest of the expression. Each of these three terms is unitless. The sy term has units of y. It is divided by m so that sx has the units of x. The square root is unitless and scales the expression for the number of calibration points, the number of unknown measurements, and the proximity of the unknown to the center of the calibration region. So one takeaway is that when you want the best results, be sure to create a calibration curve that will span the region of interest and get your unknown samples as close to the middle of the range as possible.